Good afternoon. And the first item of business is consideration of business motion 10743 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau setting out a revised business programme for tomorrow. I would ask any member who objects to say so now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 10743. Formally moved. Thank you very much. No one's asked to speak against it, therefore the question is that we agree motion 10743. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Now the next item of business is portfolio questions. And we start, it's culture, tourism and external affairs. And we start with question number one from Graeme Simpson. Thank you. Um, to ask the Scottish Government how it promotes tourism in the central Scotland region. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. The Scottish Government fully recognises the importance of tourism to the economy of central Scotland, the numerous attractions of the area, from the Kelpies at Falkirk, Coatbridge's Summerlee Heritage Park, to the UNESCO site at New Lanark, are actively promoted by Visit Scotland through a range of both digital and traditional channels across both domestic and international marketing campaigns. Other public bodies also play a key role in supporting tourism development in the area. For example, business and destination support from Scottish Enterprise, training and development through Skills Development in Scotland, promotion and protection of cultural heritage and historic properties through Historic Environment Scotland, and promotion and enhancement of the natural environment through Scottish natural, uh, natural heritage. Graeme Simpson. Uh, thanks for that answer. Um, the heritage of North Lanarkshire is undersold in my view. It's rich in history, but does not play to its strengths. Campaigners fighting to save Greenbelt um, next to the old Monkland Canal at Calder Bank believe it could become a country park and celebrate the history of the area, including what could become a canal trail, a canal her heritage trail. It could be a big tourist attraction. Uh, would the minister agree with me that such a project is worth investigating? Uh, and would she agree to see what can be done to progress such an idea? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, on that latter point, I think a discussion by the, uh, uh, the, the campaigners with uh, Scottish Canals would be a, a helpful uh, first step. Certainly we've seen with the development, uh, certainly with the, the Kelpies, but also uh, on the, the Union Canal and in, in Lithgow, we've seen the benefits of those attractions. On the wider area, I think looking at leisure recreation as an economic stimulus is really, really important. But when you can tell the stories and the very rich and deep heritage stories that we have in Lanarkshire and elsewhere, it's a good opportunity to do that forward. So I am interested, I, if the member could keep me in touch with what's happening, and we can then perhaps identify the appropriate organisations that can help with the, the, those that are seeking to do that development. And question number two, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress there has been on Brexit negotiations following the recent Joint Ministerial Committee meeting. Cabinet Secretary, sorry, Minister Michael Russell. A presiding officer, the, the latest Joint Ministerial Committee on EU negotiations took place on Thursday the 22nd of February. I was very clear going into the meeting that I would continue to make the case for Scotland remaining in the single market and the customs union. Uh, Scotland's place in Europe, people, jobs and investment shows remaining in the EU is the best outcome for Scotland. Short of this, membership of the single market and customs union will best protect us from the worst economic damage. However, the UK government is still insisting on a hard Brexit, regardless of the cost to jobs and living standards, and as we've seen today, uh, even regardless of the damage it might do in Northern Ireland. In relation to our involvement in the process, the terms of reference to the JMC made clear that all four UK governments should have oversight of the negotiations of the EU to ensure as far as possible that agreed outcomes are secured. However, this has not happened. With just months to go before a final withdrawal deal has to be agreed, there are unfortunately still outstanding issues from phase one of the talks. No agreement on transition and no clarity from the UK government what it wants from a future relationship. On the withdrawal bill, I made it absolutely clear that what happens to devolved powers must be a matter for Holyrood. It is imperative that devolution settlement is protected and the powers of the Scottish Parliament cannot be changed unilaterally by the UK government. Claire Adamson. Thank you. Um, does the Minister share my concern over the irresponsible comments made by some prominent Brexit supporters recently regarding the Good Friday Agreement? Does he agree that attitudes like this have the potential for disastrous impact as put by Ireland's Deputy Prime Minister when he said potentially undermines the foundations of a fragile peace process in Northern Ireland that should never be taken for granted? Minister. I, I very much agree. I'm very concerned, uh, increasingly concerned by the language that's being used, are, as are many people in Ireland itself. I gave evidence to the Joint Committee um, of the Eurocterus 
uh, three weeks ago, uh, in which I was asked specific questions about this. And there's a very strong feeling in Ireland that the language being used and the attitudes being shown are, are very wrong indeed. And I find it difficult to believe what I read last night regarding the views of the Foreign Secretary. If the Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom seeks to abrogate an international treaty in order to pursue his own very warped views of what the United Kingdom should do, then he is unfit for that office. Yeah. And the Prime Minister should be firing him yeah. rather than allowing him to continue to influence mat matters. As far as we are concerned, the agreement that uh, the United Kingdom and the, Irish and the EU were meant to have come to last year, in which there would be uh, no border and unfettered free trade, is the agreement that should stick. And if the UK are trying to run away from that, they should be held to it by every means possible. Question number three, Alec Rowley. Thanks, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it is given to Dunfermline Heritage and Tourism Partnership to help develop the town into a major visitor destination. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Dunfermline offers tourists a, a growing range of cultural and historical attractions within its heritage quarter and the Scottish Government through our national tourism body Visit Scotland will continue to ensure it fully maximises its potential. Visit Scotland already engages fully with the Dunfermline Heritage uh, Quarter Partnership providing valuable input, helping shape discussions and advising on successful funding bids. I also had the pleasure of announcing that the newest attraction within the quarter, the Dunfermline Carnegie Library and Galleries, were the winner of the Rius Andrew Doolan Award for the best building in Scotland for 2017, an accolade that is richly deserved. Alec Rowley. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Dunfermline Heritage and Tourism Partnership are doing a great deal of work. Uh, they are ambitious for bringing people uh, to experience the arts, the culture, the hospitality and the history of the former ancient capital of Scotland. The town was disappointed by the decision of Visit Scotland to close their tourist information centre. Dunfermline should have more support to fulfil its potential as a visitor destination. Will the Minister, will the Cabinet Secretary agree to meet representatives of the Heritage and Tourist Partnership to discuss the future of Dunfermline as a major Scottish tourist attraction? Uh, well, as I said, ministers don't directly uh, promote the individual towns within Scotland, but we do work with Visit Scotland, and there are two members, I understand, well, one member from Visit Scotland and one from Historic Environment Scotland who actually directly sit on the partnership to help advise um, the best ways to promote uh, deferment as a, as a tourist area. In relation to uh, the, the, the uh, Visit Scotland office, can I say that the Visit Scotland Information Partnership Programme now has seven members in Dunfermline, including the Andrew Carnegie Birthplace Museum um, and another, uh, a number of uh, tourism uh, attractions. They're working with the new library and galleries to make sure that they can also be a partner, to make sure that um, visitor information can be provided. And they also hope to work with Abbott House, but with a 32% decline in numbers and very few people book taking bookings um, from uh, the visitor centres. It's more about the information and accessibility. Um, I'm more than happy to find out more about the, uh, you know, the work of the Dunfermline Heritage Quarter, uh, Quarter Partnership. But unless there's any problems that he's citing, I think the best way to do that is to make sure the professionals with Visit Scotland can make sure they can provide the professional advice to make sure that Dunfermline is the tourist attraction that both he and I want, him to, to want it to be. Alexander Stewart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. With the recent success and redevelopment of the Carnegie Library and Galleries in Dunfermline, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what plans the Scottish Government have to highlight this award-winning building and what they've done to help businesses and local communities in South Fife realise the tourism potential of the Queensberry Crossing? Cabinet Secretary. Well, there's work ongoing uh, to make sure that the tourism potential, uh, working with the uh, local councils in particular, uh, they want to, to take their time as to how they might want to, to do that. But uh, we certainly, uh, through Visit Scotland, are actively involved in that. In relation to uh, the library and galleries, I've, I've visited it myself. I've helped promote it. I think it's a, a great place. I think, as Alec Riley pointed out, I think there's unrealised potential there. So I think we need all, um, all parties to work together to help promote that, because it's not that far from the centres in terms of geography, in terms of uh, transport links. So I think combining the accessibility, the profile of the Queensferry Crossing, along with Dunfermline, I think there's going to be great opportunities for Dunfermline um, as a, a tourist attraction. Question number four, Kezia Dugdale. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of Scotland's potential as a destination for LGBT tourists. 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Scottish Government funded research in 2014 found that the LGBTI visitors atta att attach significant importance to the warm welcome they can expect from a destination, how they will be treated in their accommodation and how safe they will be. Based on the research findings, the LGBTI component of Visit Scotland's consumer website was redesigned in 2015. And in addition, a number of initiatives are currently being developed by partners to further promote Scotland as a potential destination for LGBTI tourists. And these in this includes a project uh, led by Leap Sports, which aims to welcome LGBTI communities to the Glasgow 2018 European Championships. And that's been supported by a funding contribution of £20,000 from the Scottish Government. Kezia Dirdil. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? She'll also be aware that there are new Pride festivals popping up all over Scotland at the moment, notably in Fife and in East Lothian. These are great for visibility and empowerment, but they're also good for local economies. This Parliament is very proud of its record on LGBT rights, and we consider Scotland to be a great place to be gay. But can I encourage the Cabinet Secretary to reflect on whether we do enough to tell the world about that and ask her to instruct Visit Scotland to assess what financial support it could provide to Pride festivals as tourist attractions? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I, I don't actually have to instruct Visit Scotland because they're already actively looking at the and um, producing materials that will actually help promote that very welcome and, and uh, the, the, the sentiments that she's just described. In relation to funding, there was contact made by an individual who was representing the Pride events. Uh, he has been responded to, but has yet taken up the offer to meet with Visit Scotland and Scottish Government officials to actually look at how we can take forward some of those initiatives to have better promotion. And I look forward to his response. And Rachel Hamilton. Presiding officer, uh, to ask the Scottish Government how they will support the Scottish tourism sector to help tackle stigma and prejudice that can be faced amongst the LGBTI community. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I think the, uh, the tourism uh, uh, industry must take every step to make sure that everybody feels welcome and, and to actually make sure that some of the, I think, uh, historic uh, stigma uh, is addressed and to make sure in the here and now that people are, felt, that are made to feel welcome. Um, I was due to attend the Scottish Tourism Alliance conference tomorrow. I understand that that's no longer taking place. Uh, but um, initiatives that can take place at conferences like that can help people understand how they need to behave, what they need to do to make sure that everybody that visits this Scotland, uh, visits Scotland for wherever they come from, uh, makes sure, make sure that they can feel, they feel welcome Welcome. And I wish all those delegates who are either staying in Glasgow or, uh, or if they've uh, already made their way home well, uh, obviously that's a missed opportunity to take forward initiatives such as that. And question number five, Michelle Ballantyne. To ask the Scottish Government what initiatives it has planned to promote tourism in the South Scotland region. Cabinet Secretary. Our programme for government clearly sets out our ongoing commitment to promoting tourism in the south of Scotland. In the coming year, we'll provide Visit Scotland with an additional £500,000 to develop a marketing strategy which further highlights the unique tourism opportunities in the south of Scotland. We've also allocated £500,000 of capital funding to develop forest tourism, enhancing visitor experiences and growing leisure activities within the Tweed Valley Forest Park, Galloway Forest Park and on the Solway Coast. Mm -hmm. The new South of Scotland Economic Park Partnership will also have a focus on developing the important contribution of tourism to the region, stimulating sustainable economic growth and encouraging tourism businesses to capitalise on what they already have to offer. Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you. Tourism forms a key part of the borders economy, contributing to more than £200 million to the region each year. It is a sector that looks set to grow, particularly as the effects of the Edinburgh re region city deal are felt. What provision is the Scottish Government making to improve skills and employment opportunities in tourism for young people in the Scottish borders? Well, we have a tourism um, investment plan. Uh, we are actively engaged using also the developing the young workforce proposals to make sure that we can grow the opportunities for young people. I think the skills development is one of the vital parts of what we need to do to, to take forward the tourism sector to make sure that people realise realizes that tourism is everybody's business. There are multiple careers you can have in tourism, but also to make sure it is a career, um, career of choice. Uh, but it is a, a, an aspect that we're actively involved in uh, using the programmes I've just described. Question number six, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made towards ensuring that the Galloway Viking Horde is displayed in Dumfries and Galloway. Cabinet Secretary. National Museum Scotland and Dumfries and Galloway Council have been in negotiations over a partnership agreement for the display of the hoard uh, in the refurbished Kukubri Art Gallery. As the Council has uh, yet felt unable to accept the agreement, I've offered to meet the convener of the Council's Communities Committee. Colin Smith. 
thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but when I raised this issue with the Cabinet Secretary in June last year, she informed Parliament she would host a summit involving National Museums Scotland and Dumfries and Galloway to broker an agreement on displaying the hoard in the region. A date for that summit was set, but it was cancelled by the Cabinet Secretary. Nine months later, the Cabinet Secretary said there will now be a meeting, but again, there is still no date for that meeting to take place, despite the fact that Kirkcubri Art Gallery is actually due to open within the next few weeks. So does the Cabinet Secretary acknowledge the huge frustration in Dumfries and Galloway that a major tourism opportunity for the region is being missed because of the current impasse between National Museums and Dumfries and Galloway Council, in particular, the barriers being put in place by National Museums Scotland? And will she urgently intervene to ensure that the, we have a significant exhibition in Dumfries and Galloway sooner rather than later? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I was very keen to hold a summit to bring people together to broker an agreement, but at the request of the Fries and Galloway Council themselves and the National Museum of Scotland, because their um, negotiations and discussions were taking place, um, the, the, the progress was being made that they felt that that would not be appropriate at this time. Now, you know, despite officials' advice to Dumfries and, and Galloway that the proposal that was being put forward for, by the National Museum um, was one that they should accept, that has not happened yet. So I'm very keen to, to break that impasse, but I think there are a number of misunderstandings, not least what will be an offer, and I'm very keen to ensure that the Galloway Hoard, and I would stress we should call it the Galloway Hoard, not as the member says the Viking Hoard, because actually I've seen some of the, the collection and there are various parts from different parts of our history. Now the opportunities are absolutely there. I have made my commitment to this parliament and to the people of Galloway that there will be a significant part of that hoard on permanent display uh, in Kukubri Art Gallery and to make sure the people of Galloway can have that as a tourist attraction. I'm determined that will happen and that's why I'm very keen and I have intervened to make sure I can meet with the council to find out what the problems they have with it. Question number seven, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to build on the impact that the North Coast 500 route has had on tourism. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the North Coast 500 continues to be a huge success in encouraging visitors to the North Islands, one of the Scotland's most outstanding areas of scenic beauty. The Scottish Government remains committed to ensuring that this increase has positive outcomes for the communities and local businesses on the route. The NC500 Working Group, chaired by Highlands and Islands Enterprise, has expanded upon its work to address the issues and opportunities that have been identified. Um, on community engagement, infrastructure development, protection and enhancement of the environment. The delivery plan from that working group will be available in the summer and Visit Scotland is also actively working with partners for the benefit of the wider area to make sure that people visit out with the uh, summer season and off the main route. Rhoda Grant. Highland Council have over 7,000 kilometres of road to maintain. Over 830 of this is the North Coast 500. A constituent recently commented to me we used to drive on the left-hand side of the road. Now we drive on what's left of the road. Can I therefore ask, what assistance is the Scottish Government giving to Highland Council to repair and upgrade this iconic route? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm not the Transport Minister and Highlands and Islands Council are responsible for the roads that they administer, but we're very conscious, and that's why Highlands and Islands uh, Enterprise is chairing that working group, to look at the infrastructure issues, to work with the Council and other bodies to make sure um, that we can uh, make sure we've got an, an offer uh, across the North Coast 500 that suits the needs of visitors. But I do think that um, you know, talking in extremes like that is not a good advert for the North Coast 500, and I think members have to be very careful as to what will be reported as to whether people can access the North Coast 500, and I think that's a very dangerous thing she's just said. Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and if I could drill down into that answer a wee bit more. Actually, the Leader of the Council wrote to the First Minister in August last year with a request for an additional £2.5 million to fund essential repairs on the North Coast 500 to particularly sustain tourism. Is the Minister in a, in a position to confirm whether she discussed this with the First Minister and if so, what her advice to the First Minister was regarding this request in relation to tourism? Well, I'm afraid the answer to the First Minister is both the Conservatives and the Labour Party have voted against the budget. So therefore, in terms of expecting additional funding, um, I, I don't think you can come here and ask for more money when you vote against the budget. And that concludes culture questions. We move on to justice and the law officers. And we start with question number one from Bob Doris. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government what work it is carrying out in partnership with the Law Society of Scotland to support putting Scottish law firms on the global map. Minister Annabel Ewing. 
The Scottish Government is working in partnership with Scottish Development International and the Law Society of Scotland to promote an exciting new initiative, Scottish Legal International. This is designed to raise the profile of Scots law and our justice system to an international audience and to seek opportunities for inward investment in legal services in Scotland. The work of Scottish Legal International, along with other strands of work, will allow us to bring to bear the unique Scottish legal system and contribute to the global effort among international partners to tackle dynamic threats such as, for example, those in cyberspace that can impact on Scotland's citizens, its businesses and its public services. Bob Doris. I uh, thank the, the Minister for that answer. First, many people appreciate the quality of the Scottish legal system. They, including some law firms themselves, might not often consider that there's an economic opportunity for Scotland's legal sector internationally. Can I therefore ask how the newly launched Sco Scottish Legal International, as mentioned by the Minister, in partnership with SDI, can help law firms grasp global opportunities to contribute to Scotland's economic growth? Minister. Scottish Legal International is chaired at the moment by Paul Carlyle of Shepherd and Wedderburn and it is a joint initiative developed by Paul Carlyle and some, seven, uh, some nine rather, of Scotland's top commercial law firms in partnership with Scottish Development International and the Law Society of Scotland working collaboratively to promote all that Scotland has to offer as a place to invest in legal services and as a trading partner offering the very best of legal knowledge, expertise and networks to a global audience. Question number two, Gordon Lindhurst. <clears throat> to ask the Scottish Government for its response to the criminal justice social work statistics published on 6 February 2018. Minister Annabel Ewing. The criminal justice social work statistics in Scotland 2016-17 contain valuable information in relation to criminal justice social work activity at a national level ranging from diversion from prosecution to community sentences such as the community payback order to statutory through care. We have protected criminal justice social work funding for local authorities at record levels of £100 million per annum. The Scottish Government's shift towards more community sentencing, including the introduction of CPOs, has greatly benefited Scotland's communities. Gordon Lindhurst. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer, but she will be aware that completion rates for community payback orders have fallen for the third year in a row resulting in a community justice system that lets one in three convicted offenders, nearly 6,000 criminals, off the hook. What action is the Minister taking to address the mess of numerous delays in the system in which a third of CPO work placements fail to start within the Scottish Government's own seven-day target? Minister. Uh, well, I would say to the member that, of course, uh, in terms of the 2016-17 uh, statistics as regards completion, uh, rates, uh, that was only very slightly down on the previous year. I think it was 0.4%, uh, so it's a very marginal uh, decrease. Also, it may interest the member to note that completion rates for community payback orders in the member's own region have actually increased since last year's uh, uh, publication of stats, with all areas, uh, aside from East Lothian, improving, uh, uh, in fact. Um, of course, the matter of ensuring that CPOs are completed is entirely for the relevant local authority. Uh, a CPO is a court-mandated order, and the Scottish Government would expect that local authorities would prioritise ensuring that they are completed uh, accordingly. Of course, I would also say that CPOs, presiding officer, deliver tangible benefits to communities by making individuals pay back for the damage caused by their crimes uh, by carrying out unpaid work. And of course, finally, it would be very important to, uh, to reiterate that we know that the evidence shows that individuals released from a custodial sentence of 12 months or less are reconvicted nearly twice as often as those given a CPO. Runa Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister say whether local authorities will be provided with further guidance on managing breaches of community payback orders? Uh, Sorry. Uh, sorry. Social work case managers have a number of options indeed uh, open to them in cases of breach, uh, including returning the case to court, and the legislation provides the courts with a range of, of sanctions in these cases, including imposing a fine and varying the CP order. We will, of course, continue to seek opportunities to strengthen and support the use of community payback orders, and work is, in fact, uh, ongoing, I can say to the member, to update the national practice guidance, which will help to bring greater, greater clarity to breach and compliance processes. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Minister will have seen in the statistics uh, that the number of community alternatives to prison has failed to grow in recent years. 
And indeed, yesterday's statistics showed that the short, sent that short sentences of under three months still make up around three in ten prison sentences. Given the government's presumption against short sentences uh, and the, the apparently uh, uh, failing to, to, to work as intended, will the Minister now look at what needs to be done to reduce the numbers of ineffective and expensive short sentences? Minister Annabelle. Well, the member will be aware, of course, that we are seeking, uh, as indicated in the programme for government, to, to seek to extend the presumption uh, uh, in terms of short sentences because we know, and I, I think it's recognised also by the member, that short sentences are not, custodial sentences are not effective, and that is indeed uh, what the evidence shows. I, I think, though, it is fair to say that uh, the current diversion uh, uh, measures are uh, uh, continuing apace and including uh, not just CPOs, but also, for example, uh, the uh, fiscal work orders, and I think the completion rate over the last uh, year or so was around 80 plus percent, and that is important to bear in mind. Also, of course, there's the drug treatment and testing orders, and whilst completion rates there fluctuate on, a, on an annual basis, that also, of course, reflects, firstly, the, the overall downward trend in, in court volumes, and also, of course, uh, reflects the fact that such um, drug treatment and testing orders are targeted specifically at individuals with entrenched uh, drug problems and chaotic lifestyles, which means that achieving significant increases in completion rates is challenging. So I think it's fair to look at each of the, the, the relevant uh, diversion measures uh, uh, in terms of what they are seeking to do and, and, and uh, who they are directed at and take that into account. But certainly the member is absolutely correct uh, to say that we need to, to look now at extending the, what is indeed only a presumption, but we do need to do that with regard to custodial sentences. And question three, Alexander Burnett. Can I thank the presiding officer and ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce drug use in prisons? Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, the Scottish Prison Service takes a dual approach to reducing drug use in prison, focusing on both health and security measures. From a health perspective, the Scottish Prison Service strategy framework for the management of substance misuse in custody reflects the aims and objectives of the Scottish Government's national drug and alcohol strategies. It adopts the principle of recovery to reduce the harm caused by drug use. As the member will be aware, uh, prisoner health care is the responsibility of the NHS and addiction services in prisons are provided in line with local NHS board's strategies. The Scottish Prison Service delivered the Substance Misuse Pathway Programme in order to help those in its care lead a meaningful life free from substance misuse and offending. In terms of security measures, the Scottish Prison Service deploys a variety of strategic, tactical and technological responses to reduce drug use in Scotland's prisons and invests in the development of new technology and staff training to detect, deter and reduce the availability and supply of illegal substances within Scotland's prisons. The Scottish Prison Service and Police Scotland work collaboratively and are committed to sharing information and intelligence in respect of criminal activity emanating from or impacting upon our prison estate. Both organisations are committed to seeking convictions for those introducing illegal substances. Alexander Burnett. Uh, can I thank him for his answer? Uh, the 2017 prisoner survey shows nearly 40% of Scottish prisoners have witnessed illegal drug use in jail. And we know that drug use in prison is rising and the number of prisoners caught taking drugs is at an eight-year high, according to the last prison service annual report. And it is a simple truth that drug addiction is an obstacle to rehabilitation. So when will the SNP ensure that our prisons are a secure environment they're meant to be? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, um, unfortunately the member takes a rather simplistic view of this whole matter and you should recognise that uh, some 70% of those who come into the Scottish Prison Service for uh, periods of custody have a clear uh, drug, illegal drug uh, use problem uh, and many of them, the vast majority of them, will be in prison for very short periods of time. Uh, to simply expect the Scottish Prison Service to be able to unpick these matters along with the NHS over such a short period of time, very often individuals who have got entrenched, long-standing drugs problems, is quite frankly naive. Um, however, what the Scottish Prison Service, along with the NHS, do is undertake a range of work in order to tackle uh, drug misuse uh, amongst prisoners once they come into their care. Alongside that, there are very extensive measures which are put in place by the Scottish Prison Service to tackle the issue of drugs being brought into the prison estate. 
However, I'm sure the member is aware, if he considered this issue in any detail, is that the bringing in of uh, drugs into a prison estate is not something which is peculiar to the Scottish uh, prison service. You will be aware of the very significant problems which they have in England and Wales, which has contributed to the very marked uh, problems I've had with violence in recent months. Uh, but the Scottish Prison Service take forward very robust measures to prevent drugs from coming into the prison estate and where appropriately taking action alongside Police Scotland to deal with individuals who may be planning to bring in drugs or who have drugs uh, when they are within the prison estate. And Claire Hawkey. Thank you, President Officer. As the Cabinet Secretary has already acknowledged in his previous answer, many people have a drug problem on entering prison. And does he therefore agree that it's vital that we continue to invest in programmes tackling drug use? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, as I've mentioned, um, uh, tackling the use and the impact of drugs is uh, not a challenge which is peculiar to uh, Scotland or to the Scottish uh, Prison Service. And, uh, the member will be aware that the national LDP uh, standard expects that 90% of people uh, receive access to appropriate drug and alcohol treatment within three weeks. Uh, the latest figures show that in prisons, uh, 1,223 people uh, started their first drug and alcohol treatment uh, between July and September 2017, with 99% uh, waiting three weeks or less. The member and others will be aware that health ministers have also indicated that they are committed to refreshing our national drug strategy, which offers an opportunity to reinvigorate our approach to uh, the changing uh, drug landscape in Scotland. That includes looking at uh, prisoner health care, uh, which will form part of that refresh and will help to challenge uh, those agencies that are responsible for uh, dealing with these matters in looking at identifying new and more effective ways in tackling this issue which is also backed by an additional £20 million, uh, which was set out in the programme for government uh, by this government uh, to support this area of work. And uh, Polly McNeill let me know earlier that she's unable to make it for question four. Moving to question five, Lee MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how the proposed changes to the roles of Scottish Fire and Rescue Service personnel will impact on retained fire stations. Minister Annabel Ewing. The Scottish Fire and Rescue Service are currently consulting uh, their staff and also, in fact, with members of the public on their service transformation proposals uh, in the document Your Service, Your Voice. For retained duty system fire stations, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service are proposing to recruit, recruit new whole-time rural manager positions in key locations across Scotland. These managers will support the delivery of local RDS training, undertake preventative work and ensure the availability of appliances in RDS stations. The Scottish Fire and Rescue Service are also exploring the safe and planned introduction of new technology in vehicles in RDS fire stations, which can be safely deployed with a revised crewing model. Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you. Can I thank, thank the Minister uh, for uh, her uh, response and welcome uh, the measures set out. The Minister will be aware uh, of the challenges for many part-time fire crew members balancing work and home commitments with their firefighters' duties, notably the training requirements, and that's particularly the case in an island community like Orkney. So will the Minister therefore keep a weather eye and take steps to ensure that any additional training requirements uh, that are pursuant to these uh, reforms and make recruitment and retention of retained duty fire crew uh, any more difficult than they already are in Orkney and other rural areas going forward? Uh, well, of course, uh, Liam MacArthur will well know that uh, the, uh, the, the challenges that face the uh, retained duty system uh, are not unique, of course, uh, to uh, his island uh, and the north and indeed the whole of Scotland, but rather are shared in many other countries because, of course, people no longer live and work uh, in the, the same community in many parts of the country. But I'm very uh, uh, well aware of the uh, interest that Mr. MacArthur has shown in ensuring that uh, training uh, is the, the vital nature of training is duly recognised and indeed that there is resource available uh, in the Northern Isles as well. Uh, and of course, I will be happy, uh, particularly on this particular snowy day, to, to indeed keep a weather eye, as Mr. MacArthur asked me to do, uh, on ensuring that uh, the SFRS uh, maintain their absolute determination to ensure that training uh, is very much at the fore of their activities. Maurice Corey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I understand that the Fire Service aims to recruit 20 full-time rural firefighters posts each year to, for the next three years, reaching a total of 60 by the end of 2020. Is this an ambition that the Minister shares? Yes. 
Uh, well, I'm very happy to say to the member that I uh, shared the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service's vision for the transformation uh, of the service, but of course discussions are very much ongoing uh, with, in particular, uh, the unions uh, and the workforce in general as to exactly what that transformation uh, should look like. They're very interesting and exciting and innovative proposals included in their consultation document and I would encourage all members to consider responding to that and certainly the general public who may be listening uh, as well but it is certainly the case that there is uh, there are a lot of exciting innovative uh, proposals uh, to ensure that our fantastic Scottish Marine and Rescue Service can continue to meet the emerging risks of the 21st century in Scotland. Question number six Jamie Green. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the proposed merger between Police Scotland and the British Transport Police. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to delivering the benefits of a single command structure to provide integrated infrastructure policing in Scotland. The Joint Programme Board set up to oversee the integration has been advised by Police Scotland and by BTPA that operational aspects of the integration will not be ready by April 2019 as planned. As I set out in Parliament last week, we have therefore agreed that a replanning exercise should take place in the coming months to ensure all aspects have a clear and realistic delivery plan in place. A safe and secure transition to the full integration of British Transport Police in Scotland and Police Scotland remains our aim and a clear focus on public safety is paramount. Jamie Green. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Uh, last week I asked the Cabinet Secretary if he would listen to Her Majesty's Inspector of Consta Constabulary Scotland and be forthcoming about the risks and drawbacks of the merger. He responded, and I quote, the HMICS report came before we had published the explanatory notes and policy memorandum that went with the legislation. However, the bill was published in December 2016 and the HMICS report took place between February and April 2017. So will the Cabinet Secretary correct his previous comments on this? And will he consider commissioning an independent, transparent and arm's length analysis of the merger as many experts are calling for? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, President Officer, as we set out in detail when the bill was going through Parliament, the real benefits that would come from integrated policing with BTP being integrated with Police Scotland. Uh, broadly, in a similar way to which the Conservative Party set out in their manifesto at the last election to integrate BTP with civil nuclear police and also with MOD uh, policing. What I can assure the member of is that the replanning exercise which will be undertaken now by the Joint Programme Board and those members of the boards will consider all the key issues that need to be addressed going forward as they have been doing and to make sure that there are detailed plans in place for the areas where progress still has to be made. James Dornan. Thank you, President Officer. And, uh, does the Cabinet agree, given his, his last comments there, that the Tories' constant criticism of the decision to merge Police Scotland and the British Transport Police is both just rank political opportunism and incredibly hypocritical, given that they committed to do, just as you said, merge the Defence Police, Ministry of Defence Police and the British Transport Police? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, I don't know if it's for me to point out to the Conservative Party the hypocrisy in this matter, but it does stand out given their own commitment within their manifesto to abolish British Transport Police, something which they seem to want to conveniently ignore when it suits them. Uh, but what I can assure, President Officer, the actions that we are taking here in Scotland are to ensure, given the policy which has been pursued by the UK Government to abolish BTP, to make sure that we have appropriate infrastructure policing here in Scotland and to do so with a single command structure and delivering a safe and appropriate service to the travelling public in Scotland on Scottish railways. Question number seven, Gail Ross. Government, whether it will provide an update on Police Scotland's consultation regarding its 53 buildings that are no longer required. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, police Scotland undertook a consultation on the disposal of 53 unused police premises across Scotland, which ran from the 1st of November 2017 to the 31st of January 2018. Responses are being collated and analysed and will be presented to the SPA board in due course. Responsibility for the police estate sits with the Scottish Police Authority. Gail Ross. 
thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I note that the f from the 53 that are no longer required, that five are in my constituency. Will the Cabinet Secretary give an assurance that where there is a desire within the community to take ownership of these buildings, everything will be done to help facilitate this? Cabinet Secretary. Mr. Officer, I can confirm that Police Scotland uh, has used its recent consultation on the disposal of unused police properties to raise awareness of the opportunities for community ownership uh, provided by the Community Empowerment Act. Uh, I and my other colleagues in government are very supportive of the potential benefits that can flow from uh, communities owning land and buildings. Uh, and for that reason, the government set up the Community Ownership Support Service. And the uh, member may wish to be, uh, may wish to make their constituents aware uh, of uh, the provisions that are available under the support service, uh, which could assist them in taking over, potentially taking over some of these properties. Uh, but Police Scotland remain very open to the possibility of community ownership uh, for some of these properties, uh, where there is a local case that can be made uh, for, ch for such a transfer to take place. Thank you very much. And that concludes uh, portfolio questions. We'll now move on to the next item of business, which is a statement.